Here we are. Thank you all so much for being with us tonight. My name is Janice Kamina Resnick. And on behalf of Jews United for Democracy and Justice and Community Advocates, I welcome you to tonight's program. I'm happy to welcome back, welcome back my partner, David, from his travels. A special welcome to the outstanding Mike Mullen with all of the recent classified documents leak, leaks. We'll be very interested in hearing your take on those current events. It's a propitious time to hear from the former chair of the Joint Chiefs, both about Ukraine and about the leaks. Thank you for being with us. And also thank you to Warren Olney, our esteemed moderator. Thank you to our leadership team, former Congressman Mel Levine, former LA County Supervisor Zev Yaroslavsky, uh, Caroline Kelly, Rabbi Ken Chazen, and to David, of course. I get lots of emails asking for recordings of past programs. The link to our 160 plus past programs is in every single email either David or I send out. If you can't find it after you've looked in any of our emails, feel free to email me for it. Uh, a small percentage of you is still having problems with Eventbrite. Um, you receive messages which prevent you from registering. We have been unsuccessful in working with Eventbrite to pinpoint the problem. It impacts about 100 people out of the thousands uh, that register. So the best advice is to email me. I'll get you the Zoom link. And as long as you have the Zoom link and you're on our list, on our general list, you can use it to join the program. Next week, we will focus on artificial intelligence with two outstanding New York Times reporters. Shira Frankel is a prize-winning technology reporter and her uh, she's a technology writer and her colleague, Kevin Roos, is a technology columnist. They will, you? they will discuss artificial intelligence. What is it? And is it good or bad for democracy? To remind you, Kevin Roos was the first uh, journalist to do an in-depth interview with Microsoft's new chatbot, Bing, also known as Sydney. Roos's interview, which turned both creepy and scary, prompted Microsoft to immediately place new limits on Bing. It will be a fascinating hour, and I will send you links to, the, to that interview in tonight's email that I send you after the program so you can read it. The following week, we will dig into a topic many of you might not have focused on before, and that is sanctions, boycotts, and other forms of economic warfare. We have invited two experts on this topic to help us understand the role that sanctions play in global po policy development and implementation. Our speakers are Adam Smith, a partner at the firm of Gibson, Dunn & Crutcher, specializing in this field of international trade law. He also served as a senior advisor to the director of the U.S. Treasury Department's Office on Foreign Assets Control and as the direct and uh, as an advisor to the director for the multilateral affairs on the National Security Council in the White House. Our second panelist is Nicholas Mulder, a professor at Cornell, who has focused on the relationship between economic globalization, democracy, and authoritarianism. Both are widely respected and have published extensively on these topics. We will learn a lot about a subject which is rarely discussed. Now for a few more announcements, my friend and colleague, David Lehrer. David? Thank you, Janice. It's a pleasure to be back with you on America the Crossroads. Last week, I was watching at 9 o'clock in the morning in uh, Japan. So uh, we truly reach internationally. I'll be very brief tonight because there's so much for the Admiral and Warren to talk about. Admiral Mike Mullen is always a large draw. Over 4,600 people are registered for this evening, not only because of the position he held for four years under both Republican and Democratic presidents, but also because of his frankness and the expertise he acquired over the course of a long and distinguished military career. He is a very special guest. Janice mentioned two of our upcoming programs on nuanced, complex, and fascinating issues. In subsequent weeks, we'll continue to inform as we host Michigan's highly regarded and much talked about Governor Gretchen Whitmer, who will be in discussion with Larry Mantle. We'll then host New York Times columnist Nick Kristoff in dialogue with KCRW's Madeline Brand and former Solicitor General of the United States and one of our most popular guests, Neil Katyal, who will be discussing law and the future of democracy. We hope you'll join us for them all. They really should be great. Our moderator tonight is again, Warren Alvey. Warren is a veteran broadcaster, was won numerous awards for journalistic excellence, including Emmys, Golden Mics, and most special, the Lifetime Achievement Award as bestowed by his peers. He always gets to the heart of the issue, and I'm sure he will again tonight. Warren, it's all yours. Thank you, David. Uh, very much appreciate all the things you said, and uh, it's a pleasure and privilege for me 
uh, to welcome back again Mike Mullen for all of the reasons that uh, you suggested. Uh, he has been, this is his third appearance uh, for an America at a Crossroads. Uh, he, of course, is a retired admiral. He spent 43 years uh, in the Navy. He was chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff during both the Bush and first Obama administrations. Before that, he was chief of naval operations and the leader of NATO's Joint Force Command. Since retirement, he served on a number of different boards. He's also president of MGM. Uh, uh, excuse me, I don't know the full, full name of the term of the of the of the company. Um, in any case, uh, what's important, I think, too, is that he's still a public servant. And last year, at the request of President Biden, he made a, a letter delegation, I should say, uh, to Taiwan. Uh, so, Mike Mullen, it is a great pleasure, as I said, and an opportunity for me to have you back. And thanks very much for joining us. Thanks, Warren. It's great to be back with you. I also just want to say uh, welcome to our viewers. And uh, remember that uh, you can uh, you can communicate your questions to David Lehrer. He will send them to me. And later on in the program, I will get to as many of them as we have time for. So, Admiral Lehrer, it's just so much to ask you about. As Janice already said, there is obviously Taiwan, there's China, there's the war in, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, but I want to ask you this. How could a low ranking member of the Air National Guard have leaked hundreds of top secret documents on social media for weeks without the intelligence officials of the United States and the Pentagon knowing about it? Well, one aspect of it, so Warren, is uh, while, while he might be young and, and not very uh, highly ranked, uh, usually pretty bright, capable young people, uh, in that part of our profession, actually widely dispersed throughout the military, but specifically that kind of uh, uh, information technology professional. Uh, and, and there's been a lot made of his age. W one of the things I've pointed out for years is the average age in, in, in any military unit uh, across all of our military is about 21 years old. So I wasn't taken back by that at all. Many of, so many of them joined you know, at 18. Uh, there are a lot of questions associated with this. Uh, part of it is, and there's been some, you know, good reporting, and I think at least it resonates with me is after 9-11, which the core to not knowing about that was the intelligence which existed, which wasn't shared. And so in some ways, you know, we've, we've overreacted, if you will, in terms of sharing intelligence. I, I will say, uh, my, my question is, what, what's the Massachusetts... Air National Guard uh, got to do with anything, quite frankly, that has to do with the sensitive stuff that was in, uh, and I think this was uh, General Milley, the current chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, I think it was, certainly some of it was out of his daily information brief. So, uh, and it was on a system that obviously uh, is, is worldwide. The, the, the real question is how somebody like this had access. And then with the access, uh, why there wasn't some kind of supervision that, that wouldn't allow that would would deny him the opportunity to do what he did in a way mechanically at least as it's been reported uh he was different than snowden snowden downloaded the stuff he didn't do that by all reports he took photographs of it but he did it for a lengthy period of time and the the intel is coming out in the press every single day i just don't know uh, you know how much he got and i and in many ways it's very damaging intel what have you heard about damaging intel that is most damaging that you're most worried about? Well, I think uh, actually what I'm probably most worried about is the intel tied to this war uh, and the details of that. I mean, now that that's out or as we understand it, I'm sure there'll be adjustments made by actually both sides, quite frankly. Uh, and, and the reason I say that is because there are so many people that are being devastated by this uh, war that you know that Putin started, and so that's that's my reaction. I honestly, uh, at the top secret level, the kind of stuff that was in that brief, uh, my own view of that is that there should have been very limited distribution of that. Uh, there, there's absolutely no need that I can that I can think of that anybody like this should see it. Um, uh, you know, that's one. Uh, uh, the other is, and it's real. It is really sensitive, although it's not new. Is the information about what's going on uh behind closed doors in some of our closest allies uh and that's happened before i i think it was during the obama's 
second uh, term where uh, it, there was uh, uh, phone taps, if you will, or certainly listening in on Angle America in, in Germany uh, reported. It's not new. I, I think uh, obviously there will be adjustments as a result of that. Um, uh, you know, that's obviously something that's really sensitive as well. And then I think to, reported today actually was the preparation by the Chinese of a very high, very high speed drone, uh, if you will, which flies very high as one of the weapons that uh, obviously they're developing. So it's it's all you know it's all really sensitive and i think out of this there will obviously be a collapse uh, of what gets shared who has access and oversight much better oversight on on what i would call the insider threat in the cyber world uh uh the biggest threat has always been the insider threat uh and uh and that's certainly in the intelligence world as well and and i think we need to think through how particularly in in the age of the, the that we're in with the technology moving as rapidly as we can uh, uh you know we're going to have to figure out a way to to really minimize that threat i i grew up in the 60s my first job was a nuclear weapons officer on a ship a destroyer out of long beach uh in nuclear weapons you could never do anything without another person in the room basically it, it, we had what we called a two-person control system for this highly sensitive stuff, and it's a daunting undertaking to do this, but you know, one of the ideas is to put two people in the room every time anything like this, you know, gets posted or anybody moves to get access to it. Obviously, there are things that, that might might be done. Uh, as far as the content is concerned, I've seen reports that there was a somewhat gloomy assessment of uh, what how things are going in. Uh, in uh, Ukraine, but I've also seen it reported that some of the documents were in some ways altered and that uh, they were disseminated on the uh, internet in an altered form. So that sort of complicates things, it seems to me. Well, <laughs> intelligence and spying is a complicated business. Uh, yeah. uh, and so what, what I take away from that though is certainly those who are most responsible for support of Ukraine in, in our country and actually in our allies will know what the reality is very specifically uh, in terms of what's going on, on the ground. And it's been a very, I don't have to tell this audience, it's been a very difficult war. That said, the Ukrainians I think have done exceptionally well. We've worked hard and I give the Biden administration a lot of credit to support them. Uh, it's almost, if, if I were gonna be at all critical, it's it's, could you get it there a little quicker? But it seemingly has gotten there on time. Uh, and the Ukrainians have been magnificent in terms of defending their country. And I suspect they will continue uh, to be in that regard. And the, the, I mean, the United States, you know, our closest allies and the Ukrainians are really good in the intel world. So I'm sure adjustments will be made. Uh, and it wouldn't be beyond me to think that some of those adjustments might just be based on those altered documents, if you will. What's the level, what, what is this going to do to the level of trust that is necessary between us and our allies, uh, who we ask to share information with us all the time? Uh, will they be fearful that uh, things will be leaked one way or another? Well, I think they'll certainly ask that question. Uh, I, you know, there is uh, amongst us, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, US, UK, the Five Eyes program, that's the highest level, most, uh, most extensively shared intelligence right. I, I don't think it may have a it may have a bump in the interim or in the short term but i don't think it'll have any big impact in the long term i do think that after this investigation is done and we figure out what we're going to do in terms of making changes we need to share that uh, with those that we share intelligence with and and reassure them that we're doing everything we possibly can so this won't happen again uh, one report is, I believe it was in the Washington Post, that Beijing, according to these documents, has approved what's called, and I'll use the quote, the provision of lethal aid to Russia. Uh, do you think that's true? And if so, what do you think it means? Um, my, well, that the whole issue of how much China is going to support uh, Putin in this is a, is a very, very significant issue. My read on this before this report was that certainly it was uh, and while it's been in, it's been pub in public reporting, the way I read that public reporting is the in, intelligence is saying that Beijing is considering doing that, but
but had not yet made the decision. Uh, I, I, my sense is I still think they haven't made that decision. Obviously, this may put them closer. Uh, and th there's one one way to look at that, which is sort of the, the, you know, the bombs and the bullets and the machines that we know as war machines. Uh, there's another aspect of, of support, which doesn't necessarily qualify for that, uh, but certainly would help uh, Russia in building up its industrial base, if you will. They're short of chips, for example. Those kinds of things that China would be doing that right now uh, wouldn't surprise me at all. So, uh, you know, it's just it is a it, it is part of modern warfare. There are there are various levels of of uh, weapons, if you will, some of which are very obvious and others which are not. And I would suspect, you know, China is doing as much as they can you know, without people really knowing it, if you will, uh, back channel to Russia to support uh, Putin in, in everything that he's doing. Why is China doing that? Uh, I think one of the, you know, one, one of the great questions over a long period of time has been how close are China and Russia? I mean, they've got, historically, obviously, they're not close at all. Uh, and, and yet, uh, someone pointed out to me that is, a, is somebody that spent a lot of time in China uh, just to remind me that Xi Jinping's first visit when he left China for the first time after 2012, when he came in as president, was to Moscow. His most recent visit was his 40th visit with Putin. Uh, and I believe, you know, I mean, the sort of the, the high level piece of this was the, the Olympics, the February 4th piece, uh, where they got together and, and became best friends very visibly, but I think it's, I think it, as long as these two guys are around, these two countries are going to stay together. Now it's just, it's reversed historically because Russia is now much more in the dependent mode than they have been uh, um, in, in the past. And I think China knows that. Uh, and, and Xi Jinping, I think, well, he's a very clever guy and he's going to be very careful with this, but I think it's very obvious that that relationship is going to be around for, for a you know significant period of time. Iron, it's it's somewhat ironic because I think anybody that's followed Kissinger over the course of that last many decades, you know, our goal was to sort of split up China and Russia and play one off one against the other. And, and in a way, it's turned. You know, and now it's China and Russia together. You know, playing us. And I think that and that's a hugely significant. Uh, it's not a game. It's a really significant shift that we're going to have to figure out how to deal with. I just want to point out that you co-authored in the Washington Post a column on behalf of the Nuclear Threat Initiative saying that uh, President Xi needs to press Vladimir Putin to de-escalate. You talked about the nightmare scenario of nuclear weapons and uh, said that standing on the sidelines was an act of complicity. Why did you say it that way and, and what did you hope to accomplish with that? Um, the timing of that was several months ago, or I, I think maybe sometime in the fall. Um, okay. And what, what was going on at the time, uh, and I'm on the board of the Nuclear Threat Initiative, so, so it, uh, Sam Nunn, who founded that organization, it's an extraordinary organization that's been around uh, for decades, focused on the reduction uh, and the risk mitigation of nuclear weapons. Oh. Um, and uh, we had a, this was in the fall, we had a pretty significant discussion about whether Putin would use a nuclear weapon or not. Uh, and, and I'm somebody that believes he will. I, I'd like to limit that to a tactical nuclear weapon, which is a devastating weapon in and of itself. But I wouldn't put it beyond him even to this day. We knew enough in terms of our own government. We have virtually no contacts with Putin. So there was no way to message him. So one of the, one of the thoughts was that we would write this op-ed really to Xi Jinping who's got connection with Putin to message him. And we've gotten, you know, I've gotten some indication that that, that has happened. W whether that op-ed had anything to do with it, I'm not sure. But the idea was to get to Putin through Xi Jinping. I mean, Xi Jinping and China have a lot at stake here as well. Uh, and I think he knows that. So um, that the whole idea of that was to try to get a message to him to say under no circumstances, you know, open up that Pandora's box of devastating weapons. Well, let me ask you a little bit about the American and Chinese relations in the context of uh, Taiwan. You went there on behalf of President Biden last year, 
Uh, subsequent and it was to review and, and reinforce commitments that the United States has made uh, to defend Taiwan in the event of a Chinese invasion. And since then, speakers of the House, first Nancy Pelosi went to Taiwan, then uh, 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 Speaker McCarthy met with the president of Taiwan here in uh, California most recently. And when that happened, but most recently particularly, China retaliated with warships and dozens of fighter jets that they sent in the uh, direction of Taiwan. Do these meetings that we're having with the Taiwanese make things worse rather than better? Well, I think in, in retrospect, uh, I, I think they make it much more challenging, quite frankly. And while they are reassuring, if you will, and that certainly was the the, the purpose uh, of the delegation I led, and it was a bipartisan delegation. I mean, Taiwan's been a bipartisan issue, you know, for for since inception, really, uh, and uh, and and meant to send it, you know, it meant meant to make a bipartisan statement in all of our visits, uh, uh, or certainly the visit I led. Uh, that said, I would I hope we can get away from these. I would call them symbolic kinds of things. They I, the uh, something like that almost prevents a meaningful dialogue between the countries because everything is so public. The rhetoric is hot, uh, and and we're struggling with communications with China right now for lots of reasons. Uh, many of us believe that it's the worst it's been since 1972, 1979, with no end in sight. Um, uh, the Biden, the uh, President Biden, and, and President Xi meeting in Bali last fall attempted to put a floor on the relationship because and, and stop the spiraling. And I know it was a good meeting, actually, substantive, tough uh, on both sides. Uh, and it seemed to, and then the balloon incident happened, and it's it's really sort of gone downhill yet again from there. And we we really need to, to back to your question, is I think we got to get out of the symbology here, get to substance, I think quiet the rhetoric, and then ha see if we can have meaningful discussions literally behind closed doors, because there's just too much at stake. Um, I worry a great deal that in the relationship that we have right now, and that everything that's going on, that we're sort of drifting into war uh, with China, and that would be devastating, not just for the US or for China, that would be devastating for the world. And, and we have to do all we can to make sure that never happens. The question of Taiwan, but it may be bipartisan, but there certainly are political competitions uh, over yeah. how to express it, what to do about it, and uh, you know, am I more for Taiwan than you are? Uh, that sort of thing. I suggest, I suspect, what you're saying is you'd like to see that quieted down. It, it, but it is as I would, uh, although as uh, as is, I'm sure most people in this audience know, it's sort of hard to hold the politicians and to get them into the quiet mode. Yeah. And much of the rhetoric is what continues to stir this up. And there are many Chinese that look at that rhetoric as official rhetoric you know, from the country, if you will, whether it's official or not. So I, I just think cooler heads have to prevail here so that we can stop this spiral and get, get the relationship on a much firmer fitting. And we're very, much different from Russia. I mean, we're very dependent on China. We're very, I'm sorry, we're, we're very dependent on each other. Uh, our, our economies are obviously hugely integrated and, and President Biden knows that, President Xi knows that. So is there a way with that dependency to get to a place where there's a constructive outcome? I don't expect us to be great friends, but a constructive outcome, uh, not just in that part of the world, I, I mean, uh, in that part of the world, but also four of the five top economies in the world are in that part of the world. And, and so stability there is as critical, it's probably more critical there than anywhere else in the world. And we're not right now headed in the right direction. Tom Friedman, the New York Times wrote a very extensive piece after he made a visit to China and to Taiwan uh, and talked about how he thinks that uh, it's going to be necessary and it's, you're sort of suggesting the same thing that the United States and China be able to at least trust each other to some extent, a greater, in a, in a great, to a greater extent than they do now. Uh, how important is that? How would you accomplish that? And, and uh, is that, or, or is it inevitable given the extent to which we are intertwined uh, economically? 
Um, I know I don't think it's inevitable. I, and, and in fact, w with regards to Taiwan, the, the way I've, I've explained Taiwan to many audiences uh, that uh, Western audiences don't really understand in many cases how serious the Taiwan issue is to China. Right. But uh, the way I say that is Taiwan is to China like Nebraska is to the U.S. I mean, it is that integral to them. They think they own it. It is one of their provinces. And their questions are, why are you messing with this? This is ours. And, and, and that, you know, that rings true from there. And, and we're supportive of, in, in the one China policy, we're supportive of you know, peaceful reconciliation or resolution, uh, uh, quite frankly, you know, of uh, of the whole Taiwan issue. And I think, you know, I think that's really, really critical. Trust is going to be really tough. I don't disagree with it. You need to you need to try to get there. And what I found a year ago, and it continues to happen, and you indicated the, the, the reaction the Chinese after the McCarthy uh, meeting and after the Pelosi visit, which was very extensive military operations around Taiwan, the, the what I found when I was out there a year ago was it's out of bounds, badly out of bounds. China, uh, China has really worked hard to coerce Taiwan. I mean, one of the strategic objective of China would be make it so obvious this is going to happen that the Taiwanese finally just raise their hand and say, OK, you know, we're, we're going to come aboard. Uh, that coercion uh, is really significant and and it's out of balance. And so what I what has to happen, and this makes it very difficult, is I think we need to bring it back in balance. In doing that, tensions will go up, and in tensions are you know rising, it's the kind of thing where something could go badly wrong. I think we've got to do this from a position of great strength, uh, in, in a, to make sure that uh, on any given day, the president of China knows today's not the day, and he's not going to win it. If we can get to somewhere like that from the standpoint of outcomes, then I think we can start possibly start to have a meaningful conversation. But we're, we're a long way away from that right now. It's often said that uh, the reason the United States is so concerned about Taiwan is that it is a democracy. The last time you and I spoke, you said that. You said that uh, if we can't uh, support this democracy, what democracy can we possibly support? But is it really about that as much as it is about uh, military concerns and about microchips, which they make in Taiwan better than they do anyplace else. Well, I think it's about all those things. I mean, my own view is first and foremost, it's about democracy. It's 24 million people. It's a booming, thriving democracy. They have built themselves, uh, and uh, and some 75 percent of them, at least when I was there a year ago, support independence. Um, clearly, it is the semiconductor center of the world, and I think it's 90% of the semiconductors in the world get made there. 60% of the most critical semiconductors get made there, uh, and that's uh, you know that's a great strategic advantage for them, and it's a great strategic vulnerability for them. And and it's not just the U.S. depends on them because China depends greatly on them as well. So. You know that that's part of it, and then there's a military piece here. I mean, we've got allies out there: Japan, South Korea, Australia, uh, others who we are close to, uh, the ASEAN countries, uh, and being able to keep that part of the world stable is really uh, is really important. And if we don't defend that, uh, and there's a military aspect of this, Taiwan's really in what we call the first island chain off the coast, and if China owns that first island chain. They are then uh, immediately in a much more dominant military position throughout that region, uh, just by owning Taiwan and stationing the military there. Uh, and uh, Japan's very goosey about that. Uh, everybody's very goosey about that. So there are certainly military aspects of this, which are really critical as well. That's why, I mean, my own view is the, the, the One China policy has worked for decades. I would hope we can calm it down, get it off the front page, and, and keep it that way for the foreseeable future. What's at stake? Why is it so important for the United States uh, to be concerned about the dominance of China far away as it is? Well, it depends on what you believe. It, it, it's, uh, I, I, don't think any, I don't think any country is as far away as it used to be, uh, Warren, in, in the world that we're living in, first of all. Secondly, uh, and there are certainly debates about this, but China just believes in a different way of life, and and they're 
their values, their principles are vastly different from certainly those that we grew up with here and that I that I, uh, you know, subscribe to. Uh, and, and, you know, in my heart of hearts, I believe people yearn to be free, quite frankly. That's not our job to try to free up a billion, I think it's 1.4 billion Chinese people per se, but I think it is our job to represent that. And it is our job to defend those who actually uh, are looking that, you know, in the face, if you will, if it's going to change. One of the big issues, it, it's true today, it was true when I was there a year ago, uh, the whole idea of the future of Taiwan, at, you know, they looked at Hong Kong. Uh, and Hong Kong was supposed to be somewhat free and somewhat independent, and that hasn't gone very well. And that's that really has, my view, hurt the Chinese in terms of an outcome that they thought they might generate with respect to Taiwan, because the, the Taiwanese people aren't going to aren't going to trust the Chinese that somehow they'll be independent. So, uh, and I think there there is democracy at stake here, and. And not unlike what I said before, if we don't defend it there, where are we going to defend it? We're doing it in Europe in a in a big way. I mean, it's it's not directly. We're not in the fight per se, but we're certainly supporting it. And it's the same thing. So I, I, that's who we are. That's who we've been. That's what we've stood for. Uh, and I think if we give that up, start giving that up, uh, we're going to have we're we're going to change who we are and what we stand for. You said Taiwan is like Nebraska for China. Uh, what's China like for Taiwan? Um, it's, it's at least my understanding. It was, it's fairly mixed. Uh, obviously, it's a huge economic uh, chain. Uh, I, I actually uh, I had a, uh, in my bio. We've talked before, but I taught at Princeton for a while, and I was at a I was in a Zoom call with one of my former Princeton students, whose parent whose parents came over here from Taiwan. Uh, and, uh, and and they're still very active. He's a young, very bright guy up at Yale Law School right now. And I asked him, I said, do they, do, do your parents call you, do they call themselves Taiwanese Chinese or Chinese Taiwanese? He, he actually, he didn't answer the question. I mean, um, uh, so th there's an awful, there's much more, in my view, there's much more independent views now on Taiwan about being Taiwanese. Uh, certainly the, the younger generation there that obviously was born there and that only hear the stories of their grandparents, et cetera, about what it was like in China before. Many of them, you know, consider themselves Taiwanese. So, and I think that's part of Xi Jinping's calculus. I mean, how long can he let it go before it's just almost impossible uh, other than by brute military force uh, as, as part of the issue? So um, I, I, fr from my point of view, and, and it's a, uh, it, it's a, uh, cultural relationship as well. I mean, certainly from the Taiwanese standpoint, men, the, so many of them, their families all, you know, by, not, just about all of them came from there. Um, and, and they're not, at least in, you know, my understanding, they're not anti-China per se. Uh, they just, many of them just don't want to become a part of that kind of regime with that kind of life. I have to ask you about Ukraine and uh, what is your current sense of how things are going there? We keep uh, hearing uh, day after day that this is going to go on longer and longer uh, and uh, there doesn't seem to be much uh, change uh, one way or the other. It's hard to know. It's hard to know when it's going to end. I, I certainly I think uh, I hope sooner rather than later. I had spoken in, in recent months. I from what I could see and nobody's got a really uh, clear crystal ball on this that you know that there will be a major movement this year we've been talking about this spring offensive for months uh, and if the Ukrainian military and the Ukrainian people and every indication is they will continue to be superb if they continue to operate at the level they have the, then I think they will that there will be big gains this year uh, and if the Russians continue to operate like they have which has been quite frankly surprisingly bad uh, then that also should uh, generate big gains for the Ukrainians. I, I just had, it was uh, a woman that I know of was just there uh, three or four weeks ago, and uh, she came out, basically came out, talk, talk, came back talking about the will of the Ukrainian people, and the grandmothers are still making Molotov cocktails. I mean, they are going to fight for their country to the last person, was the message that that uh, they that, that she brought back. 
So the will is there. Obviously, we can, will continue. Allies need to. We need to continue to to support them as best we can. There are some vulnerabilities. It's widely discussed publicly that you know they need air defense kind of capability. But I also, you know, I, I also I'm incur I'm confident and encouraged that we uh, and and President Biden uh, and the his administration have led this. Have really worked hard to get them what they need. I think there's a meeting this week uh, of a group of 50 countries who are providing uh, capability to the Ukrainians. And so I suspect there'll be a big offensive, uh, counteroffensive, if you will. I think there'll be progress. I don't know. I mean, there are an awful lot of people talk about this ending up in a stalemate, and it's hard to know what gets traded, you know, where it stops and what the stalemate is. The president is very, Zelensky is very anxious to take it all back. There's no question about that. I think that's a lofty goal, uh, but I've been surprised by what they've been able to do so far. They've really been terrific. You said earlier that your only criticism of the Biden administration is that maybe they should be a little quicker with the things that they are providing. But of course, we're not providing jet planes, which Zelensky has asked for. How concerned are you that, or should we be, that uh, Zelensky might, in fact, uh, invade, I don't know about invading, but attack Russia, do something to uh, upset the uh, ba the balance, if there is, in fact, a, a balance, how brutal, it, or however brutal the balance might be. I don't think Zelensky is going to go into Russia or attack Russia. I think, hmm. uh, I mean, we've been through, obviously, well over a year now expressing that concern and and they have, by and large, they've complied. And I think he'll stay within bounds with respect to that. Uh, I do think, uh, I do think, if Putin chose to use a nuclear weapon, which many people have described tactical nuclear weapon as not particularly effective on the battlefield, but strategically, it would have a huge impact. And if he used it in a city, it would have a huge, catastrophic impact. And if that happened, then I think the game changes pretty significantly. I've I talked about, I don't know, I, I'm not plugged in to what we might do. I'm sure we, the United States, have created options if that happens. I don't know how you keep that, if, I, I don't know how you keep that response inside the borders of Ukraine if Putin uses a nuke. Uh, you're involved with the nuclear threat initiative, as you said. Uh, we, of course, have large numbers of strategic uh, yeah. weapons or, or uh, battlefield weapons, technical weapons, uh, as do the Russians. And we're constantly uh, re improving the, uh, the nuclear arsenal, as I understand it. Uh, and there are people who say, why do we ask, why do we do that? Uh, if in fact, uh, we're never going to use them and uh, they've never could, should be used and, and it would be catastrophic, as you said earlier. Well, there's two levels. There are the strategic nuclear weapons, and I actually I was involved. Uh, I was involved in negotiations for the New START treaty back in 2010, which put limits on the strategic uh, warheads that we could deploy, and it was 1500 or 1550, as I recall. Uh, and that's with the Russians uh, and the U.S. And that's really uh, that's really the current version of what happened way back when, when we had the the START treaty to lim start to limit nuclear weapons. The big, uh, the, the big difference right now is China is building up their own uh, arsenal, if you will, of strategic nuclear weapons. And right now, and it's back to not very good communications, they're not interested in having a discussion about that. Uh, and and it's, it's my view that actually China needs to get in the game and that their security actually would be improved if they participated in a free you know, a tripartite treaty, if you will, that would limit these weapons. They have some four or 500 now, some number like that. They're building them at a rapid rate with modern technology. Uh, and their goal, at least their public goal, is to surpass us, you know, over the next 15 plus years. Uh, that just takes the most dangerous weapons man has ever created and creates much more danger, if you will, with a third country. So, Back to we've got to have a relationship to start talking about how to put guardrails around uh, in, in many areas, but certainly this is one as well. I don't this new START treaty that I negotiated is due to expire in 2026. Russia has basically walked away from it. Uh, there's no indication that that there's going to be discussions or talks with Russia uh, about 
renewing that treaty or creating another one, which we do every 10 or 15 years and have for a long time. Uh, and it's my view, as it was actually in 2010, that somehow we're going to have to figure out a way to pull, pull China in here to contain uh, and mitigate and minimize the risks of these world ending weapons, just to make sure it's clear, these are the weapons that we're gonna, that, that can destroy man as we know it. And we've got to figure out a way to contain that. Thank you for putting it that way. It's always difficult for me to say those things uh, because I don't have any authority yeah. in, that, uh, in that area, but to hear you say it the way you do, uh, is, is it seems to me extraordinarily important. I want to go to some of the questions that we're getting from the uh, uh, from the audience. They're pretty good questions, and I promised that I would ask some, and I want to uh, uh, do it. Um, uh, Stan wants to know if China were to attack Taiwan, what are our options militarily? Well, I think I think if they did attack, we we we'd know it uh, in advance. We've got a considerable amount of firepower, if you will, in that part of the world. Uh, we'd, we'd move uh, an awful lot of capability very rapidly. The, the difficulty in the Pacific is it's a huge, huge body of water. So we would have to, to some degree, anticipate that. I think one of the discussions now is this is a lot different from Ukraine. She's going to have to, she's going to have to have reserves and stores, food, water, medical, all those kinds of things for an extended period of time already there. Uh, I, I think uh, while much, you know, much discussion gets centered on China blockading Taiwan, and they could do that, uh, it almost goes back to the 1930s. I mean, China's getting a lot of its oil coming out of the Gulf. If we stop that oil flow, uh, they'd have a pretty significant problem pretty quickly. Uh, so it, there's, a, there's a lot in play. I will say, Warren, when I was chairman from 20, 2007 to 2011, I spent, and we were in the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, and I had a, we had a pretty significant terrorist issue on our hands. Uh, but I didn't spend any time on Taiwan. I, I assure you that the current chairman and the Pentagon and the commanders in the area are spending an extraordinary amount of time on exactly this scenario. Uh, and we should never, ever be underestimated in terms of what we can do. So the plans are being made. I mean, there's yes. no doubt about that. Yeah. Um, Connie wants to know why you're not running for president. I don't have to respond to that if you don't want to. Uh, 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 Patty asks, do you think there is a risk to democracy here at home? I do. Uh, I've been uh, hugely concerned about that, uh, really, in the in the wake of of uh, January 6th, not, not immediately, uh, because when asked uh, about what happened there, I, my comment was the institution seemed to hold, you know, we did have a peaceful transition, the elections were validated, and when I say institutions, I mean the courts, even the Congress, which is, you know, comes under great criticism, because those votes got counted, and that was hugely important in a very tough situation, but in understanding the details since then about what happened and how close we were. I mean, I have absolutely no idea what would have happened had the president, had President Trump decided not to leave uh, and there was effectively a coup. I, it would just have been complete chaos uh, from my perspective. What, I, what I've come to understand uh, or believe is that, that, uh, that our democracy is, is in, is much more under threat than I realized, and to the point where I've I've really gone back to try to study it. What are the roots of it? I, I tried to get through de Tocqueville's book, uh, which is written in English that uh, you know I can't comprehend very well, but I have taken literally a course of 24 lessons to try to understand de Tocqueville uh, in terms of democracy in America. What are the foundation pieces of this? I'm trying to, and it is, I guess in a way, not surprisingly, it is the freedoms that we have. It's, you know, it's speech, assembly, religion, press. It's also the impact of local, local elections, local officials, local organizations. And I think that we're lacking a lot of that right now in terms of its impact on the country, although the elections would be an example of an awful lot of local officials who stood tall, you know, under significant challenges. So I, I in summary, the way I've looked at it is I think it's much more fragile than I realized. Uh, and, and we should treat it that way and act that way. Uh, and I think as somebody, you know, in my 70s now, 
I think I took I took it for pretty much for granted for seven decades. And and that was a mistake as well. It's not we can't take it for granted. We need to work to make sure it's strong. And it needs to be all of us. We all need to be involved in this, not just leave it up to a few. Let me go back to Connie. Are you thinking about running for president? No. Okay. <laughs> no. No, no I think, I mean, and, and you may know. I, I mean, I I dabbled in this a little bit as a third party with Bloomberg in 2016. Yeah, I, know I, I will tell you, uh, Warren, one of the things that I learned in that was was if you are if, if if you don't have the the brand if you're not one of the tribe if you try to get in from the outside you know they they will terminate you i mean that's just both parties the one exception to that obviously has been donald trump uh, who didn't come from you know who did come from the outside but i think he's the rare exception in that regard uh they do not tolerate you know outside outside candidates uh, and that was pretty clear to me so uh, EA wants to know, uh, pointing out that a lot of the people in the Republican Party have been openly hostile to support for Ukraine and Zelensky particularly, uh, what's your assessment of American policy regarding Ukraine if the Republicans win the presidency next year? Well, I think, uh, uh, I think it's, it's probably going to change. Uh, and certainly, uh, I, don't, I don't, at least from what I've been able to see, I don't think it's the majority of the Republican Party that aren't supportive. It is, it is somewhat baffling to me in terms of, uh, you know, here's a democracy that's been illegally invaded, you know, by a literally a, a, a tyrannical dictator, uh, and that somehow that we are, we come to the conclusion or some of us come to the conclusion that we shouldn't support somebody like that. Um, uh, I, I just had a friend of mine uh, who spent uh, almost a year in, in the army, in US Army, uh, in Eastern uh, Europe uh, and in Romania and, and Slovakia specifically, and you know they're petrified. They're, they're absolutely petrified there that it's, that it's going to be them next. I know that's the case in the Baltics. It always has been. When you look at Sweden and Finland uh, joining NATO so quickly, and Sweden still got some, a way to go, but I think they'll get in. Those countries are deeply neutral. There are very few people I've spoken to on the continent, and this is war on the continent, which it's been for. You know, hundreds and hundreds of years that uh, that don't think this is existential to them and their way of life. That's our interest. So I struggle with those that don't think we, you know, that we should isolate. I just it's just me. It doesn't mean the other view isn't a valid view. My my view is the more we isolate, the more likely they're going to we're going to generate really bad outcomes uh, in the globe in a place like Ukraine or other places. Back to uh, China, Carol wants to know, uh, how can we trust any commitment China makes, given how they broke their solemn pledges regarding Hong Kong? Um, we've talked about that a bit, but uh, elaborate on it if you will. Well, I don't, you talked about getting trust. I mean, trust is gonna be uh, really tough. Uh, I think it was, I think it was President Reagan said trust, but verify. I mean, that's kind of how I approach it with somebody like that. We have to work to try to get to a place where we can have meaningful conversations with them and try to get at these tough issues. Normally, uh, when you have a relationship like this, you'll try to you'll try to get to common ground on things that you agree on: health, climate, energy, stuff like that, and then get to the most difficult issue. I think right now, because Taiwan is so central and and it's so significant, uh, I don't know that we can wait to figure out how to agree on these other things and then get to Taiwan. We have to be able to do. We have to be address uh, most of these issues simultaneously. I think, but right now the door, the door is pretty well closed between us and China in terms of a relationship. There is a possibility that President Biden will call President Xi here in the near future, and and it, and to get this moving in the right direction, it's got to be those two individuals that agree we're going to move it in the right direction. Otherwise, it's just not going to happen. Well, we're closed, uh, shut off in terms of uh, governmental exchanges but in terms correct. of economics we are utterly intertwined correct there's no there's no question about that but in terms of the the policies the relationships uh and and even the business side is very you know i, I know a number of businesses and businessmen and women who are very fragile ground about whether they can continue to do business in china because of the technologies that they're investing in uh and and i think and you see now uh the united states looking at money outflows to china to pay for technologies that would be used against us or could be used against us. 
So the, even the even the economic integration is is somewhat fraught. Uh, there are areas where it's not fraught at all, and I think that'll continue uh, to to be uh, a, a place where the economies work very strongly together. Back to international diplomacy, Eric wants to know how important is China's recent quote brokering close quote of a detente between Iran and Saudi Arabia. They seem to be meddling everywhere. He adds. I think that's true. I, I, they've certainly, uh, as, as I'm sure many know, they've invested heavily in the in the sub, you know, in the in the, the global south, if you will, both in Latin America and Africa. Uh, that's not gone as well as they would liked in a lot of areas, but they've certainly been there. Uh, I think his efforts to to uh, to work with Saudi Arabia and Iran are indicative of he wants to play on a on a bigger stage. And and I'm actually I'm okay with that. Uh, those are two arch enemies that that need to figure out how to work together, and that that's part of the world that needs to be stable. So I'm I'm there's plenty of work to be done globally to create a stable world. I, it, w one of the things that I am concerned about with uh, I mean the the former communist countries, it's the you know the Russia, China, Iran, North Korea group, but there's an auto there's an autocratic group. Turkey uh, would be an example. Uh, Hungary would be another, you know, yeah. countries that are leaning from their de Democrat democracies, if you will, that are slowly evolving into autocracies uh, that are, uh, in many ways align themselves with these leaders uh, in Russia and, and in China that is of great concern and can create a significant block, if you will, politically, diplomatically and economically. Uh, and that's another part of the challenge that we have. Uh, Sid wants to know, uh, you began to talk about this, so what's your assessment of the threat of Iran and its rapprochement, uh, presumably, with the Saudis? Um, I, I don't, I've never, I've never thought Iran was a, an existential threat to us, and, and I still think that's the case. I do worry about uh, the development of nuclear weapons, you know, in that country. Uh, and certainly, uh, our relationship with Israel is incredibly important and tight. Uh, and uh, I've been with uh, Israeli friends enough to know that they're not going to stand for that. Uh, so because it really a, a nuclear weapon is existential to Israel. And I think my own view is we should get behind that and do everything we possibly can to make sure Iran doesn't have that. I think develop that. I think if Iran develops nuclear weapons, then you're looking at Saudi Arabia, you're looking at Egypt, uh, I, you would, you might start looking out in the Western Pacific at South Korea, uh, at Japan, and it just proliferates these, these the weapons of mass destruction, and we need to be going in the other direction. So uh, if anyone can intervene to make sure that doesn't happen with Iran, Saudi Arabia, that's a good thing. Uh, we don't have any questions from the audience about, uh, about Israel, but I feel obliged to ask you about it, uh, given what's happening there. And the Problems that uh, President, not, not, excuse me, Prime Minister Netanyahu yeah. uh, is causing and is having uh, are pretty concerning. I was pretty encouraged by the demonstrations, quite frankly, the the extent, the length, the cross cutting aspect of it, uh, and that's democracy in its finest, as far as I'm concerned. And it certainly brought, seems to me, it brought Netanyahu, you know, it it brought him back a little bit, but I think he's. There's no question that his coalition is self-evident in terms of what he needed to put together in order to govern. Uh, so I do worry about, you know, about being being that, you know, on the extreme, if you will. But I was pretty encouraged by uh, the Israeli people that that they said they said no. Obviously, that discussion isn't over yet. But I think it's hugely important in terms of what it represents, what a democracy can do. Uh, and I hope that Netanyahu takes that message and 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 cools it off a, a little bit. What are the present potential consequences for the Middle East as a whole, and the, not just the relationships with Palestinians, but with the other countries around? Well, the you know, I mean, it's it's what's one of the I think great uh, triumphs uh, of the Trump administration, quite frankly, were the Abraham Accords, and to see these Arab countries uh, align more and more with Israel uh, as as it shocked me that, that it could happen. My own view is, and Saudi Arabia isn't there yet, but none of it's happening without Saudi's permission. Uh, and that in time, MBS, uh, who I'm not a fan of uh, at all, but in time, he'll figure out a way to generate that rapprochement. I, I do worry that 
that what's going on now is in the in the Netanyahu administration uh, could jeopardize that, if you will, uh, in what seemingly was a move, you know, in the right direction to create possibly, you know, a longer term peace throughout the region. Uh, and then part of that obviously has got to be how do we finally figure out, uh, you know, something along the lines of a two state solution for the Palestinians, although I, I you know, I don't sense Netanyahu's in favor of that at all. Uh, here's a question from Bob. Uh, it says some people have suggested that uh, Vladimir Putin is isolated, getting bad information from his advisors uh, who fear telling him the truth. Uh, what do you see in, in that context? I think it's extreme. I, I think that's exactly right. I mean, I this is 20, 2010, 11 timeframe. I, he, he was isolated then. He was getting really bad information. We knew that. His intelligence was bad. It's much worse now. That said, that often extends to or, or goes to a part of the conversation that says, well, maybe somebody will take him out. I, you know, I and, and it's I suppose it's possible, but I, I just don't think that's going to happen. These survivors that run these countries have been their whole adult life figuring out how to survive and they're masters of it. Uh, they're not just good at it. They're masters of it. So while he he doesn't really know what's going on, he's not getting good information, although he does seem to be getting out a little bit now. Uh, it, to to see the troops a little more, so that may that may help. But he is extremely isolated, uh, and I, I don't expect he's going to change his view. I have a friend of mine that actually, who's a Russian expert, that thinks Putin has won because he's basically destroyed Ukraine, uh, and his country is doing fine. So uh, you know, there's a, that's that's a different view. I, there's no question he's going to try to continue to turn Ukraine into rubble. I do hope. That we're able to get to a point where Putin back to this end game. Two things: where Putin can't do it again. One and two. I think my own view is we need to bring Ukraine into the EU now, uh, and then address the challenges they would have in terms of qualifying to underpin them with an economic future to help them rebuild, and also sort of the implied security guarantee that being part of the EU would bring with it. Putin has said he doesn't think that Ukraine has the right to exist. He's been that strong about it and made it a very public uh, statement. And apparently he sold a lot of people in Russia on that idea. And yet there are, of course, historic ties between those two countries that are very deep and culturally uh, important. Uh, how, what, what about Russia itself? Well, I, when this started, uh, Warren, I, one of the things I said, and I think we have to pay attention to this, is when this ends, what's going to happen to 40 million Ukrainians and 144 million Russians? Yeah. Uh, and I think one of the things that we did poorly after the wall came down is we didn't do anything for Russia. And in fact, I would argue we stood on, I'll use Putin metaphorically, but we stood on his neck and we gloated. He's never going to forget that no. through the day that he dies. I mean, that's just where he is. I don't think we should. I think we should be very careful and not make that mistake, you know, at the end of this. Uh, and I don't know how that occurs at this point. There are a lot of reconstruction efforts, I think, going on right now with respect to Ukraine. But I think Russia's uh, Russia's going to be a devastated country as well, not 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 turned into rubble, but certainly in lots of ways. And I think we're going to need to be sympathetic to the Russian people, certainly not the Russian leaders. And that's a pretty tough. Uh, that's a pretty tough, you know, uh, needle to thread. We got a minute left. Anything you'd like to close with? No, just thanks. I, I think uh, uh, one of the things that we talked about this before we came on air, and and one question got to this. You know, I, in public discussions now, I I lead almost no matter what the subject is, uh, I I lead with a discussion about the fragility uh, of our democracy, and 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 I believe that through and through and. We have to make sure that we right this ship uh, and never get any, never again come as close as we came uh, on January 6th. Uh, and I don't think that's going to be, that, that's not going to happen without leadership and everybody getting involved. As I said at the outset, uh, too many things happening. There's too much to ask. Come back and join us again. You have to do it. Thanks. Warren. I appreciate it. It's always okay. good to be with you. Thank you very much. Next week, uh, the New York Times reporters, Shira Frankel and Kevin Roos, Artificial intelligence, what is it and what will it do to our democracy? Pat Morrison of the New York Times, of the LA Times, 
will moderate, a good friend of mine, and she's at the LA Times, not the New York Times. Uh, that'll be uh, next Wednesday, April 26th, five o'clock Pacific. Audience, thank you very much for being with us. Good health to you and be safe.